بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتون إلا وأنتم مسلمون My dear brothers and sisters in Islam If you remember last week I informed you of a death in our community. One of our respected elders passed away, passing on to meet his Lord Azza wa Jal. And you know, when a loved one passes away, it's, it's quite natural to be filled with sadness and sorrow, to take a moment to reflect. And believe it or not, it's even okay to cry, regardless, man or woman. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went through this very thing throughout his life, loved ones passing on. There's one particular moment that stands out, and that is the passing of his son Ibrahim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam visited his son, still a baby, was with the wet nurse, the house of Abu Saif, who was a blacksmith. His wife was nursing Ibrahim, and he fell ill. And so the Prophet wasallam went to visit and check on his son. And the first visit there was one just to see. He held his son. He looked into his eyes. He smelled his scent, and then he left. And then as the sickness increased and his death drew near, the Prophet wasallam came back to see that his son would pass away. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began to weep, to cry over this loss. And the companion that was with him, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, asked the Prophet Wasallam about that. He says, oh, even you, O Messenger of Allah, you're weeping? As if there was something to that. Why would you be weeping over this? It's from the decree of Allah after all. The Prophet والسلام, he says, Oh, Ibn Auf, this is nothing but mercy. He says, He says, the, the eye it sheds tears and the heart is filled with grief. And we say nothing except which pleases our Lord Subhana. He says, oh, Indeed, O oh, Ibrahim. We are grieved by your separation. This, this hadith is very powerful in that it acknowledges human emotion within the framework of Islam. Acknowledging human emotion, what we feel, what we experience, what we go through. It's not something that should be downplayed or overlooked or dismissed. Simply to focus on the do's and the don'ts and the tasks that we have to or have not to. Islam is not a mechanical, robotic faith, but it's, it's very robust, all-encompassing. Not only it, 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 it instructs us and encourages, sheds light on what we should think and believe and understand, and then what we should do, but it also helps shape our attitudes and how we feel about things. You know, on January 20th of last year, 2020, the CDC confirmed the first case of COVID-19 here in the United States. And since then, as documented by the CDC, this is not ABC or NBC or CBS or FOX or whatever other thing that reports news, the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control, they reported that there are 25 million cases of this virus in the United States since then, resulting in approximately 427,000 deaths. You'll find similar numbers reported by John Hopkins University of Medicine. These are like the most reliable and accurate sources for this type of data. And why I say that is because this year, death has been in front of us, made front and center more than it has perhaps in the past. 
and the impact of the pandemic has been extremely profound, both broad and deep. And it's not over. And I don't think we truly understand the impact and the implications of it. And we won't really, I think, until later on down the future. Thinking about that can be overwhelming. It can be troubling and even depressing. And so to cope with those feelings, to cope with those maybe worries and fears and anxieties, to cope with the reality of death, because you're right. I mean, some would say, well, look, people die every day. Why are we getting fixated on this one particular cause of death? Well, you're right. People do die every day, but this is, this is something that's, that's novel. And so it draws our attention to this, this very human reality. So there are those who may choose to ignore it by either downplaying the reality of death and disease or conspiracy theory in a way. I'll just conspiracy theory this thing until it, it just means nothing to me. And then there are those that may become incapacitated by fear. They just can't continue. They can't move on. They can't do because of the fear and the anxiety. But as people of faith, we're always searching for the middle course, the balanced way. We seek to understand the world as it truly is. We have to understand the world as it truly is, not as we want it to be or as others may want us to think it is, but we try to figure out reality. And then we shape our response, both attitudinal and behavioral, meaning how we feel about things and what we're going to do about them. We shape that using our faith as a framework. So what does our faith say about death and dying? We had a very intimate reminder of that last week from our own community, and we get those from time to time. What does our faith say about that? Every soul shall taste death. It's a reality we have to embrace. In fact, it's perhaps the most certain thing in our lives. Lives, yours and mine, that are filled with so much uncertainty. Death, there's no doubting it. If we embrace that and live with that fact in a faith-minded manner, we can become aware and prepared for what lies beyond and not afraid to the point that we are paralyzed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازِ Every soul will taste death, is the beginning of the verse, and then he continues, and you will not, and you will only receive your full reward on the day of judgment. Whoever is spared from the fire and is admitted into paradise will indeed triumph. He says, وَمَا الْحَيَةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَعُ الْغُرُورِ And indeed, the life of this world is no more than a delusion of enjoyment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is helping us understand the reality of death. The reality of death. It's not left a mystery to us as people of faith so that we become worried and scared and paralyzed as to what we should do about it. There are many people today that they would rather dismiss the topic out of fear. I don't know. What's going to happen after that? So I'm just not going to address the issue. And I'll continue living for what I do know. They become very afraid of it. Death, that is. Because they don't understand what lies after it. But as people of faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us clear guidance so we can understand it as a reality, develop feelings and an attitude, and then do something about it. What about sickness? 
and disease. What does our faith have to say about sickness and disease? So we can understand and develop feelings and attitude and then do something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has addressed sickness. That's something that you can brush away because you don't like it. Allah has addressed two types of disease. The first is in the heart, the disease of the heart. And you can find this mentioned throughout the Quran in multiple verses and chapters. We might say this is the primary objective, if you will, of the Prophet ﷺ, to purify. Was sent to purify mankind, purify their hearts from all types of diseases. And then Allah addresses physical ailments and sickness. Ramadan's around the corner. Think about the verses which obligate the fast of Ramadan. And who is exempt from fasting? Allah addresses that. Those that are ill. Sickness is a part of this world. And we've also been instructed to seek the cure for both types. The cure for the diseases of the heart and the ailments of the body. And while the cure of the heart is spiritual in nature, primarily spiritual in nature, the cure for worldly sickness, bodily sickness and ailment can be both. Spiritual or physical or a combination thereof. This was the way of the Prophet ﷺ. The hadith which was reported by the great Imam Ahmed and others. Companions were with the Prophet وَجَاءَتِ الْعَرَابِ The Bedouins that came. And they asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, أَنَّ تَدَاوَى أَنَّ تَدَاوَى So they asked the Prophet, should we take medicine? Should we, should we seek medical treatment and attention essentially you know the bedouins in these narrations they're mentioned that the bedouins came and there's a reason for that you know the people that were with the with the prophet وسلم, they loved when the, the arab came because they were simple and straightforward people think about the question should we take medicine for you how simple of a question is that should i take medication for many of us, we, there's, we have medicine cabinets at home. We carry medicine in our cars. Some of us have it in our desks at work. There's medicine. We surround our lives with it. Medicine. Somebody were to ask you that question, you think, it's like a young child asking such a question. And that was the way of the Bedouin. They were simple, straightforward, yes or no. Tell us what to do. And the companions, they loved when the Bedouin came because of that. They may ask questions that they were shy to ask themselves because it may have seemed unsophisticated. And that's the way it kind of seems to us today. The Prophet وسلم, he says, yes. Should we seek medical attention? Naam, ya ibadullah. Tadawo. Oh, my servants of Allah, or all oh, servants of Allah, you should seek medical attention. For in Allah Azza wa Jalla, Lam Yad, Lam Yada, Da and Illa Wada Allahu Shifa'in, Ghaira Da in Wahidin. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not sent down a sickness or an ailment except that He has sent with it the cure, except for one thing. And they asked, What is that? And He says, Al Haram. Old age. I'm sorry, elders. That's something we all have to go through, insha'Allah. You know, a person may say, well, there are multiple interpretations to medical attention and treatment. Because I want you to be, I, I want you to be informed about this issue from a faith-based perspective I'll share a couple of conclusions, and these conclusions are drawn from the illustrious schools of Islamic law. The four schools of Islam. That's what we're interested in. We're interested in the four traditional schools of Islamic law and what they have to say. We're not looking for the fly-by-night opinions and the anomalies and the... Unless to refute those types of things. But what we find in these four schools of thought is going to capture 
our tradition in some way. There's a consensus, by the way, regarding medical attention and medication. There's a consensus that it's something that is legislated in nature. The details, however, are differed upon regarding the nature of that ruling. The Hanafi and Maliki schools declare medical attention and treatment mubah, permissible. Certainly permissible. The Shafi'i school deems it recommended to seek medical attention and treatment. In the Hanbali school, they allow it while saying, placing your trust solely in Allah is more worthy. And then there were a few from Imam Ahmed and Imam Shafi'i's disciples who said it was an obligation. Right, so here you can see the consensus is generally that taking medication is permissible. The general ruling is it's permissible, though that ruling may change based on individual or communal circumstances. It may be something that increases in nature. So basically, if the ingredients of medicine, for whatever you're taking it for, are not impermissible, it's not made of something impermissible, and it's not legitimately and genuinely proven harmful. Then there's nothing wrong with it, and it could be exactly what's needed to bring about relief. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب أستغفره إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله والحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا في كما يحب ربنا ويرضى ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإسان إلى يوم الدين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما Brothers and sisters if you note the first خطبة here talked a lot about what you need to know and alluded to what you should do. There's also an especially important element to this whole thing that often goes unaddressed, and that's how you should feel. How should you feel after a year of the pandemic? How should you feel after a year of so much strain? There are two things I want you to keep in mind that will certainly shape your attitude, that should shape your attitude. The first is, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّ مَعَ الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so surely with hardship comes ease. Surely with that hardship comes more ease. Many of you are very familiar with these verses. With that understanding, our Prophet ﷺ said that there's no hardship except that there will be some form of ease to come and relieve and remove that burden. Hardship will always be overcome by some form of relief. Even if that's your own death, there will be relief. The second thing is, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was reported to have said, قَالَ اللَّهُ أَنَا عِنْدَ ظَنِّي عَبْدِي بِي This is a hadith Qudsi where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrates that Allah said, I am as my slave thinks of me, meaning I'm able to do for him what he thinks I can do for him, reported in Sahih Bukhari. So when it comes to how we appraise, if we could use that term, how we appraise Allah, what we perceive he's able to do, We should always be positive and hopeful. He's merciful and forgiving. He will pardon us when we seek his forgiveness. He will accept our good deeds when we offer them correctly and sincerely. He will answer our prayers when we call upon him. And he, he will deliver us from our burdens and hardships. That is having a positive assumption of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So with that understanding, point number one and number two, we should never find ourselves completely overwhelmed. Sure, there are times when the eye sheds tears and the heart feels grief and we say nothing except that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should never be totally overwhelmed. We should always err on the side of hope. So we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us safe, to bless us in this life, and then the next, to restore health to, to those of us that are ailing and are sick, to restore strength to those of us that are weak, to free us from any debts and burdens that we find ourselves close to, close to drowning in this life. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.